<laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, this is a special ISC webinar. Um, this was a workshop for ISC 2021. Uh, the title is Causal Inference for Environmental Policy, and we have an excellent panel with us today. Um, Dana Goyne, Joan uh, Casey, and Joel Schwartz will be presenting some of their studies. Uh, and I'll be the moderator, and we will, we hope to have a very interesting discussion at the end. So we're kicking this off with Dr. Dana Goyne. Uh, Dana is a postdoc at UCSF at Reproductive Sciences, and she will be talking to us about water fluoridation and birth outcomes in California. So with that, uh, Dana, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great, thanks so much. Um, so thanks, yeah, thanks so much for having me today. And I'm gonna be talking about um, a study on water fluoridation and adverse birth outcomes in California. Um, and I first uh, became interested in this question um, after a project I worked on in which we analyzed the relationship between community water fluoridation and fluoride levels in maternal urine, serum and amniotic fluid uh, measured during the gestation. And we found significant correlations between the water fluoride levels and the levels of each of the biologic samples. Um, but as I was working on this analysis, um, I realized that at that time, there were no studies evaluating the effects of water fluoridation on adverse pregnancy outcomes in the US. Um, however, there is evidence that fluoride exposure might affect neurodevelopment among children. So here is a selection of systematic reviews evaluating the effects of fluoride on neurodevelopment. Um, and since preterm birth and intrauterine growth restriction um, have also been linked to neurodevelopment among infants, um, I hypothesized that a portion of the effect of fluoride on neurodevelopment might be operating via adverse birth outcomes. Um, so as you might know, um, water fluoridation is often cited as one of the top public health achievements of the 20th century uh, for its prevention of dental caries among children. And it is one of the only public health interventions that is applied to the entire population without any opting in or opting out requirements. So whether you receive fluoridated water within your water system is unlikely to be a function of socioeconomic status, race, ethnicity, or any other um, individual characteristic. And so this strategy really promotes dental health equality across groups, um, which can be so dependent on the educational attainment of parents, um, access to dental insurance, um, or the ability to afford dental and orthodontic care. Um, however, every public health intervention does have costs and benefits. Um, and there is research lacking around potential costs of water fluoridation with respect to reproductive health. And since in 2018, more than 200 million Americans received fluoridated water, even if there is a small effect of fluoride on reproductive health outcomes, um, the public health implications of uh, this could be substantial. Um, and by um, this lack of epidemiologic research um, also allows for some misinformation to proliferate. And so, the goal, my goal is by conducting rigorous research on potential links between water fluoridation and adverse birth outcomes, um, we can really try to make sure that any policy making that occurs around water fluoridation can be informed by evidence. Um, and using a causal inference framework can really help us design a study that will help us get the best possible information to evaluate this question. Um, so this is a generalization of the causal inference roadmap that researchers at Berkeley developed, um, which I'm adapting to this specific study. Um, and so I'll go through each step of this framework in the following slides. Um, so first, um, we have to articulate a well-defined research question. Um, and this can be very useful for answering policy relevant questions um, as we can specifically formulate our question to be asking what the impact of a policy would be if we were to implement it. So in this example, I'm, I'm interested in the effects on birth weight and gestational age of a hypothetical intervention that would reduce water fluoride levels to 0.7 parts per million and 0.5 parts per million. And this first hypothetical intervention corresponds to reducing the water fluoride levels for those systems that exceed 0.7 parts per million to 0.7 parts per million, which is the current recommended level by the, from the CDC. And the second estimate um, is the effect of re reducing the level to 0.5 parts per million, which is lower than the current recommended level. Uh, so next we need to articulate the assumptions that we need to make for the statistical parameter to align with the causal parameter or said another way, uh, the assumptions required for the data we have to tell us the answer to our question. And if these assumptions are violated, the answer we get won't be the correct answer to our question. So um, we need there to be exchangeability 
um, or that people with one level of fluoride exposure would have had the same average outcome as people with another level had they been exposed to that level. Um, we also need there to be positivity or that there's a positive probability for each person of being exposed to all fluoride levels. Um, no multiple versions of treatment means that being exposed to, um, for example, 0.7 parts per million of fluoride um, corresponds to the same type of intervention for everyone. Uh, no interference means that the level of fluoride in water system doesn't affect the birth weight or gestational age of births to pregnant people who live in a different water system service area. Um, and finally, we need a correctly specified model in order to ensure we're correctly summarizing the relationship between fluoride and birth outcomes. Uh, so next, we're going to uh, design the study. So for this study, um, we're using birth records for the state of California. Um, and this is helpful because we have good reason to believe we have the entire population of births that occurred to residents of California, um, which limits the possibility that some selection mechanism might be um, influencing our results. And so the birth records were geocoded to the pregnant person's address at the time of delivery and then linked to the water system boundaries. Um, and we're linking these birth records to the average level of fluoride that was present in the community water system um, where the pregnant person was living during the gestational period. Um, and so we assigned the pregnancy the fluoride level in the year of the pregnancy. And if the pregnancy spanned multiple years, then we created a weighted average with the weights, the proportion of the pregnancy that were spent in each year. And by um, carefully examining our data generating mechanism, um, which is the process by which our data came to exist, um, we can design the study to be as robust as sources um, of potential bias as possible. So a big piece of this question is what factors might be affecting the levels of fluoride people are exposed to during pregnancy and whether those factors might also influence the risk of adverse birth outcomes. And so to better understand our data generating mechanism um, and thus what confounders will need to account for, um, we need to understand what determines water fluoride levels in the water systems across California. So we're gonna take a quick detour um, into the history of water fluoridation in California um, and the process of determining fluoride levels for each water system. So in 1995, um, California passed a law that all water systems that serve more than 10,000 customers must fluoridate their water once they identify funds to do so. And so this has resulted in a lot of variability in when and where water has been fluoridated across the state. Um, however, historical data on fluoride levels for water systems across California um, aren't publicly available for all water systems. However, um, California water systems are required by law to release a water quality report, um, which are also called consumer confidence reports, to their customers every year that list the detected levels of water contaminants. So this is an example of a water quality table from the city of Compton's um, uh, consumer confidence report from 2018. And so fluoride, as you can see here, um, including treatment related fluoride is on the list of required chemicals. Um, so I began compiling these water quality reports for every water system in California um, for as many years as I could. And I've been creating this database of fluoride levels. And so to acquire these water quality reports from every district, um, I've been using all the publicly available records. And then in areas where the previous year's reports aren't available, um, I've been using uh, Freedom of Information Acts the Freedom of Information Act to request copies of historical reports. Um, so these plots illustrate a portion of this database of fluoride levels by water system in California. So the plot on the left uh, shows the average variability in fluoride levels among the most populous counties in California from 2000 to 2018. And here the dotted line represents the current recommended level of 0.7 parts per million. Um, However, because I am still in the processing process of FOIAing the older water quality reports, this analysis today is gonna to be limited to 2010 to 2018. And the plot on the right shows the variability by water system in Los Angeles County, uh, which has the largest number of water systems. And you can see there is substantial amount of variability both across and within the systems over time. You might also notice a large increase in the water fluoridation levels around 2007. Uh, which is when the Metropolitan Water District started fluoridating the water that it delivered to um, the Southern California districts that it serves. Um, and there is also a de decrease starting in 2015, uh, which is when the recommended level of fluoride changed from a standard that varied depending on the ambient temperature um, to 0.7 parts per million for all districts. Um, and if we look at the urban classifications of each county, uh, we can see that the large central metro counties um, on the left are more likely to have higher levels of fluoride, especially in the post 2007 years. Um, and this is likely because they have 
both greater public support for water fluoridation and more money to in, uh, support installing the fluoridation systems um, and a uh, larger water system size as well. Um, so we determined that uh, the water fluoride levels are likely to be a function of urbanicity, uh, the size of the water system, um, environmental co-exposures such as ambient temperature, public finances, um, and the trust in government. Uh, so this concludes our brief detour into how the water fluoride levels are determined. Uh, so now once we linked the birth and the fluoride records, um, we included any births where the parent's address was able to be geocoded, where the fluoride levels were available, and uh, the outcome variables in the covariates had non-missing um, values. So now um, we need to evaluate the plausibility of our assumptions. So exchangeability, uh, for example, can be violated if there's confounder we have not controlled for, um, which is always possible. Um, but for example, there could be, it could be that areas that have higher natural deposits of fluoride could also have higher levels of other exposures, um, like potentially arsenic or lead that could affect birth outcomes. Um, positivity could be violated if the people who have very high levels of fluoride in their water, um, for example, are so different from those who have lower levels that we can't really get a good control group to estimate their counterfactual outcomes. The no multiple versions of treatment could be violated um, if, for example, the natural sources of fluoride have a different effect on reproductive health outcomes than um, treatment-related fluoride. Uh, we could have some problems with interference um, if there is a lot of um, movement across water systems. So if someone was often drinking water from a different water system than the one that served their residents. So if they worked in a place that was served by a different water system um, and thus were exposed to different levels of fluoride, um, that could cause some interference. Um, and finally, there could be some nonlinear relationships or inter interactions that we haven't accounted for in our model. And so now that we've delineated our assumptions and the ways in which our analyses could be vulnerable to bias, um, it's time to estimate the effects of interest. So um, our goal was to estimate the effects of our hypothetical intervention of reducing water uh, fluoride levels on birth outcomes. And so to do this, we used a linear regression model with a natural cubic spline uh, to allow for nonlinearity in the effects of fluoride. And we also adjusted for individual level characteristics, including um, maternal age, race, ethnicity, insurance type, educational attainment, and the month and year of conception. We also adjusted for the water size and the temperature and urbanicity at the county level. And we included um, county level unemployment and income inequality um, as proxies for the public finances and trust in local government. And then we predicted the outcomes of the fluoride levels that exceeded 0.7 parts per million were then reduced to 0.7 parts per million. And we did the same for 0.5 parts per million. Um, and to account for potential clustering within water systems, uh, we used a clustered bootstrap for inference. So on the left, you can see uh, the results for birth weight. So we observed um, a small negative association for birth weight um, corresponding to both interventions with a larger association um, observed for the 0.5 parts per million intervention. Um, and I'll just note this is in the opposite direction of our hypothesis. <laughs> um, and the confidence intervals um, cross the null in the 0.7 parts per million intervention, um, but do not for the 0.5 um, intervention. Um, on the right, we see the estimated differences in gestational age attributable to our interventions. Um, and for both interventions, they are small um, and the confidence intervals cross the null. Um, so there are several limitations to this analysis. So since we weren't able to get fluoride levels for every year for every water system, um, there are some people who are missing fluoride levels and are thus excluded from the analysis. Um, we also excluded people who um, don't get their water from a community water source, so who are on well water. Um, and this, both of these could introduce selection bias into the analysis if there's a factor that we haven't accounted for that's associated with both birth outcomes um, and living in an area that is um, missing a fluoride level. There could also be selection bias from the exclusion of fetal loss uh, with our birth records unnecessarily exclude. Um, there's also a fair amount of measurement error associated with the water fluoride levels, um, which could have caused misclassification of our exposure. Um, and finally, there could always be unmeasured confounders that we haven't accounted for. 
Um, however, while these potential sources of bias do preclude our estimate from being interpreted causally, um, it is still useful to estimate this association. Um, this is still the first study to link population level fluoride exposures to pregnancies and to um, assess the relationships with birth outcomes. Um, we were able to use G computation to estimate the effects of a hypothetical intervention of reducing lo the levels of fluoride in community water sources to 0.7 and 0.5 parts per million. Um, and we accounted for nonlinearities in the effects of fluoride and controlled for both individual and area level confounders. Uh, so in conclusion, we found a small negative association of the hypothetical intervention of reducing fluoride levels to 0.5 parts per million on birth weight. Um, and we didn't see an association with gestational age. Um, but there is the, the possibility of re remaining selection bias, measurement error, and confounding. Um, but using a causal inference framework really helps us to identify these potential sources of bias um, so we can work towards mitigating them. And the next steps in this analysis um, are, I'm going to continue FOIAing the water quality reports to fill in some of the missing fluoride levels, um, also going to include preterm birth, uh, small and large for gestational age, um, term birth weight and birth weight for gestational age z-scores as additional outcomes. Um, I'm also going to evaluate whether there are heterogeneous exposure associations by um, maternal and infant characteristics and environmental co-exposures. And finally, uh, we'll be replicating this analysis in a pregnancy cohort study in which we'll be measuring fluoride levels in maternal urine during mid gestation uh, to improve the measurement of the fluoride exposure. So thanks so much. I'd like to um, acknowledge my collaborators and the funding that supported this work. Thank you, Dana. Um, in the interest of time, if there are any burning questions right now, we can take maybe one. Uh, but I think uh, otherwise we'll uh, let all leave all questions for the end to have a, an, an, an in more interactive discussions after we see all presentations. So any any burning quick questions for now? Okay. So then um, next we have uh, Dr. John Casey who is an assistant professor uh, at the Mainland School of Public Health um, and is also the co-chair of the um, ISC North American chapter. And she will be talking to us about the, well, you can see the title. So John, <laughs> all yours. Let me unmute myself. Okay, great. Let's get going. So we have some time for discussion. So here's what I'll talk with you all about today, uh, a little bit on background on antibiotic use in livestock, then talk about the methodology that we used, which was a synthetic control method, uh, results and next steps. Okay, so for folks who aren't familiar with this, we have gotten to this place in the United States where we use a lot of antibiotics subtherapeutically in livestock feed. A lot of this is driven by the way we raise animals. So historically, uh, there were really large numbers of livestock farms in the United States with small numbers of animals living on them. And over time, there's been this uh, flip where we now have increasing numbers of animals on farms and very few farms. So there's been this like big consolidation and concentration of livestock, which has led to um, living conditions that are not conducive to growth, uh, which you can see here and that have led to inputs of antibiotics. And this is done in a few ways. So therapeutically, just like humans, when animals are crammed together like this, they're more likely to get sick. So antibiotics are used therapeutically, but they're also used subtherapeutically. And that's in two ways to prevent disease outbreaks when animals are living under these really crowded conditions. And number two, to enhance growth. Um, we found out that giving animals low levels of antibiotics disrupts their gut flora and actually allows them to grow more while eating slightly less. And so it can be, um, from a cost perspective, helpful for farmers to do this. So what are we talking about? This is a chart of how much antibiotic use, well, antibiotic sales have taken place in kilograms uh, over time from 2009 to 2020 in the US. Um, the, main, the big point take home here is this white dash line is kind of an estimate of how much we're using in human medicine. So we're using more in livestock than in humans. Um, and a main one of those antibiotics is tetracycline. So why can this, why do we think this could be a problem from a human health perspective? Um, when you're 
at one of these livestock operations, there's a lot of bacteria. Some of it is resistant to antibiotics. Uh, when you introduce levels of antibiotics, it kills off the non-resistant bacteria that allows bacteria carrying resistance genes to grow and take over. And then those bacteria can also pass on their resistance genes. So we're essentially creating this environment that's propagating re antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, as part of my dissertation, which I don't get to talk about that often, we actually found that living close to these livestock operations uh, put individuals at increased risk of having a methicillin resistant staph infection. And there's um, been other evidence around this as well, not just from our group. And so we're one, we're curious if um, this is this is happening elsewhere. Um, and so we have the opportunity in 2018, California enacted a law limiting antibiotic use in livestock. And this was by far the strictest law to date. Um, and basically what SB 27 did, this law, was require a veterinarian's prescription for any therapeutic use. This wasn't previously the case. Um, you could just go purchase antibiotics online and administer them. Um, and it also um, banned other uses like low dose levels of of, of low dosing, like I was talking about, that is just enabling growth promotion. And so we wanted to take SB 27 kind of as this natural experiment that would allow us to try to isolate the effect of livestock antibiotic use on antibiotic resistant infections in humans. And so the method we wanted to use to do that was synthetic control. Um, and one reason this is helpful is because we have this challenge in environmental epidemiology where let's say we're trying as we were uh, interested in studying the relationship between livestock antibiotic use and antibiotic resistant infections in humans. But we often have confounding by socioeconomic status where you know, people in lower socioeconomic status neighborhoods are more likely to be exposed and more likely to have resistant infections. So this can mean if we have other unmeasured confounders like this, we're not going to have a situation where the association we're estimating equals the causal effect that Dana just did a really nice job talking about. So, um, you know, randomized controlled trials get around this by randomly assigning exposure, but in environmental health, we can't ethically randomize people to different levels of hazardous exposures. So we have to use other situations that arise. One of those are natural experiments, right? So here, the natural experiment can effectively break this link between socioeconomic status and our environmental exposure of interest, allowing us to better estimate this effect. Um, and so that's kind of what we have here with SB 27. And so this is um, the, kind of the framework so SB 27 goes into place in 2018. We're interested in estimating resistance patterns among E. coli urinary tract infections over time. And so we did this using um, a synthetic control. And so you can see in blue, this is what we're, you know, this is stylized, obviously, um, what we might expect to happen in California after the law goes into place. So we see reductions in resistance. We then can create a synthetic California where SB 27 doesn't go into effect and compare um, resistance prevalence among E. coli UTI in these two places to try to get at the causal effect. And so I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Um, these are our two main collaborators on this work. Uh, Sarah Tarkov is the PI of this work at Kaiser Permanente in California, uh, and Kara Rudolph is here in epidemiology at Columbia. So why E. coli UTI? Um, a few reasons. These are common and costly. E. coli causes a large portion of urinary tract infections. And as I mentioned, we know that these pathogens can spread from livestock production. I mentioned the environmental pathway, but there's also evidence that eating meat that's been improperly cooked can actually lead to urinary tract infections as well. So to do this work, we're using data from BD. Um, and they provided us data on the proportion of monthly state level E. coli urine isolates that were resistant to four different antibiotic classes over the time period from 2013 to 2020. We had data from 358 providers 
um, and from 34 US states. So just to kind of give you a sense of what this looked like, every row would be a um, positive urine culture and we would have <clears throat> then the drug category that it was tested against. And so we would know whether for this person, um, their UTI was resistant to each of these four classes, yes, no, yes, no. And we were particularly interested in extended spectrum cephalosporins and tetracyclines because these were antibiotics that were used pretty heavily in livestock feed in the pre-SB27 period that we would expect the use of them to go down a lot in the post period. So this is where we expected to see potential reductions in resistance among human UTI. Okay, so I keep saying we did this with a, a synthetic control. What did we do? So we have the actual California. Um, and what we did was we used a weighted composite of those other 33 states in our sample to mimic the pre, uh, pre SB27 trends in resistance patterns among UTI. So this is kind of similar to difference in differences, but now we're relaxing that parallel trends assumption and we're basically building that parallel trend into the model. Um, and we use this set of other states, these control units, we reweight them to match those pre-treatment outcomes um, in California. Uh, and this is allowing us to better approximate the counterfactual outcomes. So this method generally is used when you have a small number of treated units. So a lot of times it's used around single state policy changes where other states can be used to make up the control group. And so we do that to create this synthetic California. And so to really get at this, this is kind of what it might look like. So we have, let's say this is resistance to tetracycline over time in California before SB 27 goes into place in 2018. And then we uh, use those other 33 states to generate a synthetic California. And we're really trying to match that pre-period trend. Um, this is one place where you can run into problems. If you're not able to get a very good match on the pre-period trend, you can't really do the synthetic control well. Um, so we were pretty lucky in this study that we were able to do that, but I've been part of other studies trying to use this method where it's kind of fallen apart right here. Um, and so to generate the synthetic control, we're selecting variables at the state level that were important predictors of antibiotic resistance over time. And so these are some of what we included um, at the state level, again, for each of the states, uh, percent female, percent of different racial ethnic groups, percent of different age categories, prevalence of type two diabetes, um, the number of slaughterhouses. This is related to, I mentioned, um, eating meat um, cooked improperly can lead to resistance. Uh, and then also we had information of the composition of the hospitals that were contributing to the sample from every state. So some of the assumptions in this model, um, one good thing is it doesn't rely on the parallel trends assumption of difference and differences. So you're, you're effectively doing this yourself, um, but we have to assume there are no post intervention changes influencing the outcome that differ between California and the comparison states. So one example of that is we actually had data from Maryland but we had to exclude Maryland from our sample because they instituted a similar law in 2019. And so there would have been a change going on in Maryland that would influence the outcome. Um, and then we're also assuming no unobserved confounders of the decision to implement SB 27 and the post law outcomes. So this could be if for some reason, everyone in California suddenly got really worried about antibiotic resistance. And there was also a lot going on in hospitals around po policy changes related to antibiotics that could change the post-law outcomes but are um, also related to this decision to implement SB 27. Okay, so what did we find? Um, these are just showing you the percent of antibiotic resistance to these four antibiotics in California and in the other states that made up our synthetic control. And so you can see in general, California had higher prevalence of resistance to the four tested antibiotics. Um, the great thing about synthetic control is this is basically all I show you. And now we look at the main results. So what we did was we estimated the difference in the proportion of UTI resistant to each of those four antibiotics between California and its synthetic control for each year. 
And we also estimated these 95% confidence intervals. And so I'm going to just flip through the four antibiotics now. So this is our first result for aminoglycosides. So this is one that we had not expected we would see a change in. And in fact, we do not. So the line at zero here indicates whether we're seeing an increase or a decrease in resistance. If it's below the line, that means there was a reduction in resistance to that antibiotic. If it's above the line, it means an increase here. Nothing's going on. Um, so here's where we started to see something with extended spectrum cephalosporins. And this was one of the antibiotics that we had hypothesized we might see a change in use in livestock. And now we are in fact seeing a change in resistance. And so we estimated the SB27 was associated with a 7.1% reduction in extended spectrum cephalosporin resistance. Um, we also don't see anything going on with fluoroquinolones or tetracyclines. And so now I'm gonna show you a couple stratified models by sex and by age, just focusing on the extended spectrum cephalosporins where we, we may be seeing a signal. So we wanted to see whether this was uh, different by men and women. So UTIs primarily um, in people under 65 occur in women, maybe 90% of those among people under 65 occur among women. Men are just not, uh, you know, physiologically are not getting as many UTIs until later in life. Uh, and then even then it's often associated with catheter use. So anyway, here we're seeing something pretty similar for men and women. We're seeing a reduction actually in resistance for both. Um, but it appears for men potentially to be a little bit more driven by younger men. Although these are, these are wide confidence intervals because as I mentioned, there aren't, there aren't too many men um, under 65 with UTI. Okay, so a few limitations here. The data that we used to generate the synthetic control was not comprehensive. It wasn't all of the UTIs in every state and it um, wasn't every state in the country. Uh, and the susceptibility testing that I talked about to figure out the resistance profiles relied on hospital specific practices, um, although they were all following clinical and laboratory standards. Uh, there could be some small differences by hospital. And we also don't currently, as of yet, have farm level, level data or meat level data to look at whether there are actually changes in resistance among bacteria find, found on livestock farms or in the meat that people might be eating that could be giving them these urinary tract infections. So that is related to next steps. So <laughs> this team has a whole nother area of work just around um, retail chicken meat. So during this whole study period, we had research assistants going out in California and buying a lot of chicken meat and sending it to our labs to do resistance typing and also whole genome sequencing because there are specific uh, genomic markers that indicate their livestock associated strains. So there's a lot more going on on this end that will kind of help us explain potentially what we're seeing in this larger epi study. Um, and I'll stop there. And then just again, Thank you to folks at Kaiser Permanente in Southern California. Sarah Tartov is the PI of this grant. Folks at BD for providing the data. Uh, Kara Rudolph, who really led the synthetic control analysis here at Columbia and um, other collaborators at Hopkins and George Washington. So thank you. Thank you, Joan. Uh, again, any super quick clarifying questions? Um, no, okay. Excellent. So um, the last presentation will be by Dr. Joel Swartz, uh, who is a professor at the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health, Environmental Health Department. And Joel will be talking today about the difference in talking about causal modeling versus actually inferring causality in environmental health. Um, so with that, Joel. Thank you. Um... Let's go. Can people see my screen? Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, you know, before causal modeling, um, 
what we had in environmental health and in epidemiology in general were Bradford Hill's criteria for inferring causation, inferring causal associations. Um, and his criteria included a number of things, such as that the cause occurs before the effect, but it included several things that we don't include in causal modeling, and which I want to emphasize are still important in drawing conclusions about causality today. One is consistency. You know, causal modeling tries to draw causal inference from an individual study. We use design and analysis in ways that we hope will make that give us a causal effect. But the fact is that to convince human beings, in general, we want to see more studies, more than one study, and we want to see consistency across related kinds of outcomes, which it, Bradford Hill initially told to us. And this is true even for true randomized control trials. Um, there's been a big controversy over Biogen's Alzheimer's drug because they ran two randomized control trials and one saw some protective effects and one didn't. So the notion that we can do a single study and draw conclusions doesn't even hold for randomized control trials. Um, we want to see some consistency. Um, Bradford Hill also liked the notion of a monotonic dose response relationship. I think many of us might want to relax that because there could be reasons why it is not a monotonic relationship. But another key thing that he highlighted were mechanistic studies. And these could be mechanistic studies in humans so that if I have an exposure that I think is causing heart attacks, then does it cause some of the things that we think increase your risk of having a heart attack, like high blood pressure, high cholesterol, greater systemic inflammation, et cetera. If we see that, it makes us happier that this is a causal relationship if we don't it doesn't. And these criteria have not gone away since Don Rubin introduced, you know, our modern approach to causal modeling. We still need to consider all of these things while we apply causal modeling methods to our studies to firm up our conclusions from the individual studies. So causal modeling is a more formal approach and it applies to individual studies. Now, what do we mean when we say that A is causal for Y? Well, when I was four years old, we had an electric stove in our house and it was one of those things with those spiral, you know, things that got hot from electric resistance heat. And when they were really hot, they glowed red, right? But when they stopped glowing red, that did not mean they weren't hot. And so one day I put my finger on the stove and I burned it. And I screamed and yelled and my mother came in and put it under cold water and stuff like that. And then she told me, if I had not put my finger on the stove, I would not have burned it. And that's what I mean by a causal effect. If the treatment had been different, the outcome would have been different. Now, the problem is that we only observe the world that happened and um, outside of Netflix and Amazon Prime and 
the movie theater, we don't really see the multiverse. Um, you know, there's only one Spider-Man at a time. Um, so, um, so there's no way to know that. And, and inferring causality for individuals is, is essentially impossible. But we can ask what would have happened if the population had been exposed to a particular exposure, A prime, instead of being exposed to A. And if that is different than what happened when they were exposed to A, then we think that there could be a causal effect of changing exposure. But now I'm comparing two counterfactuals, as you were just shown, you know, a few minutes ago. Neither of those things happened. Everybody wasn't exposed to A, and everyone wasn't exposed to A prime. And so we need to come up with methods, as you were shown, for estimating what would happen under those counterfactuals. Okay. Now, imagine I randomly assign subjects to two groups. I'll call them C and D. And I'm going to give treatment to one group and a placebo to the other. Now, because I randomly assign people, I think it doesn't matter if I treat group C or I treat group D, because the expected outcome under treatment is the same in both groups because I randomized and the distribution of confounders is the same. And so that way I can get a surrogate for my unobserved potential outcome. And so the goal, as you've also heard already, of causal modeling is to make the exposure groups exchangeable. So I wanna make them independent, for example, of all of the confounders. So there are different ways of doing that. One which is more common in epidemiology is to use forms of statistical analysis of data manipulation to make exposure independent of the confounders. So synthetic control was an attempt to make a different California which hasn't gotten treated, but whose distribution of other predictors of outcome is the same as in the real California. Um, and propensity score methods are, are ways of doing that as well. But the other approach that is more common in, in <clears throat> excuse me, in social science is to use quasi-experimental designs to produce exchangeability. And that, that's the difference in differences that you heard about. And yes, uh, the synthetic control is sort of a mixture there. Um, <clears throat> and so, Let's talk about the modeling example. So a common approach in epidemiology is to use inverse probability of treatment weights. And it comes from this idea. Suppose people with high cholesterol tend to have higher exposure, but there are still some people with high cholesterol who have low exposure. Or specificity, let's assume that there are only half as many high lows as there are high high in my study population. Well, then if I give twice as much weight in the analysis to the people who had high cholesterol and low exposure, then now in this weighted population, exposure is independent of cholesterol. And furthermore, it now no longer matters what, how health depends on cholesterol. Is it linear? Is it nonlinear? Does it interact with weight? 
doesn't matter because it's no longer associated with my exposure. And so I can do this for all the covariates. And if there's no omitted covariates and there's positivity and the other assumptions you've already heard about, then that's looking like a randomized trial. So let me give you some examples of propensity score analyses that have been applied in air pollution. So this is a, a paper by Yan Wang um, who looked at survival in the Medicare population of the Southeastern US. There were 13 million people. They were followed for 12 years. We knew their zip codes and so we matched them to air pollution by zip code. Um, in this particular case, we used an additive risk model instead of a multiplicative mix risk model. A, because it makes interpreting effect modification easier. And B, because it's collapsible, unlike the Cox model. And therefore we can make it doubly robust by controlling for all the covariates in the outcome regression, in addition to using inverse probability weights. And so if you look at the results that we got, we found a hazard difference um, in both men and women. We found that the effect increased when we looked at older and older people, we found that people who had congestive heart failure were at much higher risk than people who didn't. The same was true for people with COPD and diabetes and a previous MI. On the other hand, we did not see much difference by race. Um, we did see higher risk in people who were Medicaid eligible and interestingly, we saw lower risk in rural populations. Now I want to highlight this age difference. On an additive risk scale, the older the people were, the larger the hazard difference. But on a multiplicative scale, it went in the opposite direction. Now, how can that happen? Well, Whoops, sorry. The absolute risk of dying for people age 85 and older is six times the risk of dying for 65 to 74 year olds. And when you have such a huge change in the baseline rate, this increment is a still a smaller percentage than the change in the baseline rate. And so you can get these, these interactions going in the opposite direction because there's so much difference in the baseline rate. And that makes it harder to interpret. And that's why we did an additive model. Um, this is a model um, using inverse probability weighting looking at hospital admissions for stroke, COPD, myocardial infarctions, et cetera, with annual PM 2.5 and ozone, and we see significant associations. And when we restrict to PM less than the annual, than the current annual average standard, we see larger effects across the board um, at these lower concentrations. And we're still seeing effects for ozone when we restrict to observations that are below the daily ozone standard because there is no annual one. Another propensity score model, we, we use sequential truncation. So here, we just look at all of the deaths that occurred, no matter what the concentration was, 
and we see a significant effect of PM2.5. When we restrict to deaths that occurred less than 12, the effect size is a little larger and it keeps going up as we go to smaller and smaller concentrations. So exposures less than eight micrograms per cubic meter in an annual average have about 50% larger effect size estimates per unit change than exposures that are above the current standard. And we saw the same thing for the daily standard that the effect size went up as we restricted to people who were never exposed um, above reducing thresholds. And the same thing happened with ozone and with NO2. Quasi-experimental designs are really nice because all of these other models re require that nasty assumption you heard, which is that there's no omitted confounders. But here was a study that looked at US military families stationed in the United States. One third of the families are relocated every year to a new base based on military need. On we need, we need a Jeep mechanic here. And, and, and the family member who's in the military is a Jeep mechanic, off they go. Presumably that should be unrelated to air pollution levels. There were in this population over 100,000 children um, aged two to five and 1.2% of them were hospitalized every year for respiratory disease. And an additive risk model showed that ozone was associated with an increased risk of hospitalization of 0.35%, which is, you know, a quarter, basically almost a third of the baseline. So a rather substantial effect of ozone, we're moving, we would think, randomized people to exposure. Now, speaking of moving, another advantage of moving is that moving allows us to look at change in exposure rather than level ex of exposure. And that, after all, is the causal question. If I change exposure, what happens? That's what we want to know. We don't want to know, had everyone been exposed to a lower concentration, would they have had better health? We want to know if I change their exposure by an intervention, will they have better health? So what we did is we stratified our analysis. This is Yara Abu Awad's study. She stratified the analysis on the zip code of origin of everybody who moved in the Medicare population. So we're only controlling two people who lived in the same zip code, but moved to different zip codes. And that ought to control for all area of origin, old zip code level covariates, measured or unmeasured. And if the decision to move conditional on the original zip code, if the change in pollution is random because they don't really know what the pollution in the place they're moving to is, um, then we ought to have a causal estimate. But in addition, Yara fit a propensity score model based on individual and area level covariates at the new zip code. Um, I'll skip over that. Here's a look at the balance. If you look at the balance just due to moving, which is these red dots, you can see that out of all of these covariates, there are only two that cross the standardized difference line of 0.1. So in fact, moving 
pretty much randomized people to all of these covariates and therefore hopefully to others. But when she then controlled with inverse probability weighting, these blue dots are amazingly close to, you know, to the zero line. There is extremely good balance in this analysis. And what she found was a rather significant hazard ratio among these movers for the change in exposure, um, which curiously was bigger for the whites than the blacks and which also persisted when you restrict it to people who had never been exposed to concentrations over the standard. So those are the kinds of things that we can do in addition to the ones you've seen before um, using causal methods in an analyzing a single study but we still want to go back to Bradford Hill and ask, do we see animal studies that support this? Do we see chamber studies? Do we see intermediary biomarkers? And do we see more than one study before we conclude that this is a causal relationship? Because causality is a decision of human beings and not of our. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, we have two minutes left, so we, we don't have much time for, for a discussion, but um, does anyone have any questions or comments? Yes, Barrett. Hi all, thank you for sharing. I'm newer to causal inference, but um, each one of the presentations was really helpful for me. Um, I guess one maybe kind of cross talk question I had um, is regarding like language with explaining causal inference, because I, I think that actual like outcomes and stuff are quite intuitive and, and probably more so than a lot of the traditional epi methods we use, but um, maybe some of your decisions of how you come to, to use the descriptions you do, like, um, you know, synthetic California or hypothetical interventions for Dr. Casey and Dr. Gowen's presentations, but, or if you've had pushback on any kind of description you've used before. Go ahead, Dana, you're better probably suited to answer this. I was just gonna say, I think a lot of it is kind of just, yeah, based on the people who develop the methods and kind of how they describe them. So for example, um, I know the, so the synthetic control method it was developed by some economists um, and that's kind of how they described using their method and um, similarly I'm not I can't remember like where I came up with the term hypothetical intervention but I'm sure I got it from somewhere in the literature so um, yeah I, th I think it's often the people who are developing the methods who come up with the terminology and then that kind of permeates but I don't know if other people have other thoughts about that. Well, counterfactual comes from David Hume, so that goes back a while. Uh, but um, yeah, I actually prefer to say potential outcomes than counterfactuals, because I think the general public gets that better. But I, I agree with Dana. This just, we inherited this language from the people who developed the methods. I think you can explain synthetic control pretty easily, right? We're going to take a weighted average. You know, we want to control. I mean, think of a case control study. You want to match somebody perfectly, right? Well, I don't have a perfect match, but maybe if I made a weighted average of 10 people, I could get a match control that's really, really close. And that's a synthetic control person. So I think you can make that point pretty clear. <laughs>